Okay, so welcome everyone. One of the things that I like to do when I'm listening to someone is watch what's happening with their hands. Have you ever noticed? This is something, you know, I, I trained as a therapist. I still do a bit of it now and doing more spiritual teaching. But somewhere along the line, I began to notice that people's hands were talking. You know, minds were going, words were coming, and then another kind of language was happening with the hands. And it became very fascinating, particularly as I became more energetically sensitive, to notice where the hands were expressing. So, for instance, and, and this is true, people who take my retreats and we're in dialogue or one-on-one -on -one sessions or when I'm listening to anyone, actually, um, it's like, oh, are the hands, like they're down here? We're talking about survival and ground and, and you know, and from here, something about the heart. And here, when people are talking about their beliefs and their thoughts, guess where their hands are, right? They're up here. So why am I talking about this? Well, it was interesting. I was um, yesterday listening to a panel um, with Hamid and Kabir and Robert Sapolsky, and they're having this conversation. Here it goes. <laughs> Not trying to do that. They're having this conversation between really an essential spirituality and kind of a hard-nosed materialist point of view. And it was very interesting to watch both Hamid, as we, he was talking, he was becoming more passionate and leaning forward and gesturing from here about what an essential human being is like. What does that feel like? What's the interior experience of that? And this is what he was doing. And when Kabir was talking you know, about these essential qualities of being, again, a pointing, a gesturing, unconsciously, to the heart. This is very interesting, isn't it? It is to me, you know. Like something in us knows, has a feel, a felt sense for our essential nature. And as we attune with it, very often, not always, we find ourselves gesturing here to the heart area. So this gives us a clue, I think, because in my experience, the heart area is a portal, probably the most accessible portal to our essential nature and what it means to be essentially human. And the heart area, <clears throat> in my experience, has remarkable depth, remarkable sensitivity Remarkable knowing in the very core of it. So a portal, an opening, and there are, it's multidimensional. There's different levels to the heart. <clears throat> and it's very interesting to be able to guide people or track people as they journey into and through the depths of their heart and touch what is essentially human. It's a very beautiful, sacred process. One that I'm always touched by, blessed, feel blessed to, to witness and, and help facilitate and to see others doing the same. So, you know, it's what I love most, <laughs> you could say. It's my heart's desire actually, to facilitate and celebrate this unfolding of the deep heart. So the heart is really, really remarkable, as I said, in its depth and, and the mystery of its qualities. When we're, when we're infants, there's such a, a radiance and openness there, isn't there? You look in the eyes you know, of an infant, just those big, wide, open loving eyes, very sensitive, very open. 
<clears throat> there's a knowing there that's implicit. That comes later, the knowing of the heart. But an implicit knowingness as well. And then what happens? We go through our developmental stages. We grow up, so to speak. And we often lose touch with this native innocence and openness and radiance of the heart just by navigating life. You know, <clears throat> losses and moves and divorces and not to mention developmental trauma, right? Which actually deeply impacts the heart on, on subtle and not so subtle levels. So, so part of it is our educational system. We're educated to prize our minds and our analytic thinking for their problem set solving capabilities. So we neglect because of an emphasis, a kind of distraction or overemphasis on thinking the, using the strategic mind. But also the heart will incrementally and sometimes dramatically close when it feels unwelcomed, when it feels neglected, abused, insulted, right? Have any of you experienced that in your lives, <laughs> right? We all do to varying degrees, you know? And what do we do when we're little? So we start closing our hearts because it's unbearable. It really feels like too much to deal with. And sometimes we're not even aware that that's happening. And sometimes we are. Sometimes we'll make a conscious choice. Never again will I trust another person because there's been such a profound betrayal, right? And that, that maybe there's been an abandonment and then a shutting down and we abandon ourselves. This is the key point. We abandon ourselves. It's too painful to remain intimate with what feels essential. And so the layers get added and we're not even aware of it. And at some point, very often, this area is numb. And our attention is up here, you know, and maybe we're normally vigilant or hypervigilant if we've been exposed to trauma and we feel ungrounded and is unhearted a word? I'm just kind of improvising here. <laughs> Disheartened maybe is discouraged. Courage comes from the French word cœur, meaning heart, right? We're discouraged. We lose heart in our life. So the heart has these layers of conditioning and, and um, it's, uh, I've often described it as a kind of, the, the investigation of the heart is like an archaeological dig, you know? Think of the Grand Canyon with the layers, you know? Except this is our psychological heart in our conditioning. So the deeper you go, you know, the tenderer the layers of the heart. We kind of discover why we close the heart in the first place. We have to re-experience at least a little bit, not all of it, um, the vulnerability and the pain that induced us consciously or unconsciously to close our hearts. <clears throat> deeper than this conditioned level, and it goes very deep, our sense of self, our sense of worth, or unworthiness, or self-acceptance, or self-love, just on a psychological level, goes very deep. Our ability to sustain an intimate contact with another person, to be in relationship authentically and intimately, this is all heart-related, right? So deeper than this is an intermediary level that can be felt at the very back of the heart which I poetically call the soul. And when people speak of contacting this level, either within themselves or between themselves and others, they use this word. They use the word like deep heart or soul. We feel a soulful connection with someone. We are, on, we are connecting on an essential level. This is like a level between the universal and the individual in this portal of the heart. These are the essential qualities of being, of love, of kindness, tenderness, compassion, appreciation, deep curiosity, wisdom, clarity also. There's a quality of clarity here that is complementary to a clear mind. We call heart mind, prajna, or heart wisdom. So as this is uncovered, it feels like the sun's coming out, 
You know, these are like rays of the sun, these essential qualities of being. <clears throat> we light up inside. And it's very interesting to sit with people as they light up because you can feel it. I mean, you can see it in their eyes, you can see it in their faces, and also just in their energetic field. There's like more light in the field as this begins to open. Not just the heart, actually, the whole central channel, this is true, but I'm focusing on the heart in this particular talk. So this is a very, a very profound and a very beautiful level to contact within ourselves and to share with another. When we meet our soulmate very often, it's there. I don't believe in soulmates. I believe in a pool of soulmates, <laughs> kindred spirits, you know, who can relate on this level, and we can mature into being able to relate on this level. It's something that can develop with time and attention, right? And above all, who's the greatest soulmate? You know, look in the mirror. That's the one. That's your closest, most intimate one. And I mean that literally. Look in the mirror. Look with fresh eyes, look with innocence, look without judgment, and fall in love. Fall into those eyes that you see, right? Get married. Okay, well, this is also as beautiful, and, in part, and there are archetypes here. All of this is an archetypal level. You know, that we're into transpersonal psychology, we're into uh, <clears throat> Jungian psychology, we're into... Uh, shamanistic experiences were into the archetypes, right? These are very potent life energies that begin to arise and pour out of us in our, in our ordinary human lives as our kingliness, our queenliness, our healing capacities, the artists in us, the warriors. These archetypes start manifesting and, and showing up Sometimes in random acts, you know, of courage and kindness and love, sacrifice. There's a little danger here, though, of getting identified with this level because it's so juicy, right? And we, and we think, you know, I'm the one, right? I'm the greatest whatever. We get inflated very easily when we identify with these archetypes. And we can also confuse these essential qualities with our true nature, and that's a very important discernment because these qualities and our conscious access to them will vary. They'll come and they'll go. And we can attend to them, we can cultivate them, but like all experiences, they come and go. They're like rays of the sun, okay? Deeper still than this soulful level, we're going out of the individual level into the universal, which I would call the great heart. It actually doesn't matter what we call it. Great heart, universal heart, unconditional love. But it feels like really a falling back, a surrender into something so magnificent and vast and loving. It's actually the only thing, not a thing, that can hold really with compassion the suffering that we experience collectively. Not just our individual suffering, but the collective suffering. So the heart is, is a portal, an opening. And like Ramana spoke of the heart, he said um, the heart is neither inside nor outside of the body. How's that for a koan, right? The heart is neither inside nor outside of the body. In other words, it's non-local. There is no inside or outside. It is a metaphor, right, for pure consciousness, for our true nature. But interesting that Ramana would use the, pick the word heart, isn't it? With a capital H. Right? Very interesting. The heart of awareness. Right? Not a mistake that this metaphor arises because of the accessibility through the human heart. Through the human heart. So the heart does not, even though when we speak of the heart with a capital H, it's non-localized, so global, we can't say the, that heart of pure consciousness is anywhere in particular. It's not in the body. But we sense it most easily here through the heart area. This is important. But it's also supported 
by <clears throat> other centers. In other words, for if we're going to live from an open heart, we actually need to have a clear mind also. Otherwise, we're sabotaged by our stories and our images, and, and they, they um, create disturbance in the heart. We all know this experience when we feel offended, we feel rejected, we feel judged. You know, we have this idea of who we are that we have to defend, and then there, there's this emotional turmoil that we may or may not experience. So if we're hooked into our stories and our images, our, our self-image, if we're identified with it, it's very hard actually for attention to rest in the heart area. Does that make sense? Right? So we need to get comfortable with not knowing. Not knowing is such a friend. Such a friend. Don't know. Don't know, can't know, don't need to know. It's my little aphorism for you. Don't know, can't know, don't need to know. That's it. That third one's really important. This is instruction to the conditioned mind. As we are investigating our true nature, this is beyond the ordinary mind's ability to grasp. Ordinary mind grasps objects. There's even a place in the brain where that happens. Right? But to know our true nature deeply requires attention to drop into the heart. Further, if we feel unsafe in the environment or, or interpersonally, socially, you know, we're not going to keep our heart open. We can't sustain an open heart. If I feel like you're going to invade me or abandon me or attack me in some kind of way on some level, that's where I'm going to feel really shaky. And that's where my attention is going to be going to trying to keep some sense of ground, and I'm going to be vigilant, right? It's going to be very hard for me to sustain awareness in and as the heart. So an illumined mind, an illumined belly, it's a team, right? It's like this whole project of awakening, awakening up, awakening down, awakening out. It's really into the core and radiating out. It's, it's, a, it's global. All these centers are important um, and supportive, supportive to have a sense of stability, deep ground, supportive to have a clear mind, right? So that we can, we can share. So one of the interesting things is, <clears throat> in terms of accessing these depths of the heart, and, and especially our true nature, the beauty of it is, it's always here. You've been hearing this forever, right? Everyone you go to, they say, it's always here, always here. It's true. That's why everyone's saying it, right? It's in the very core of your experience right now. It is not something exotic or esoteric. It is an open secret. It is in plain sight, this simple, loving awareness. So this is our greatest source and our greatest resource and our greatest source as well. The conscious recognition of this we call presence. So presence is our greatest resource in terms of helping to unpack residual conditioning. So some people think, oh, I have to dig through all my conditioning and identifications to get to the deep heart. Not true. It's available any moment. Other people think, what do other people think? I don't know what other people think. I just want to say that's not true. You can, you can evoke and attune with presence. However, if the system is unstable, if you have a lot of conditioning to deal with, attention will get tugged out of that and pulled back to an area of identification. So there's a back and forth in this process, a kind of tasting of our essential nature, and then, hey, where'd it go, right? Getting pulled back into our kind of conditioned, I'm a separate self identity. And then we open again, and then we close again. Has anyone had that experience? Opening, closing, opening, closing. I got it, I lost it, right? This is so archetypal, speaking of archetypal process. But the point I want to make here is that when we touch into presence, heartfelt presence, loving presence, this provides the optimal environment 
optimal healing and integrative environment for our conditioning. I guess that's an important point, so I stopped, right? An optimal healing environment. Why? Because now, from presence, we don't have an agenda to change or fix, subtract, or add anything. We are able to be intimate, actually, with our experience, to allow it to be. Now, there was a beautiful metaphor used by uh, the Tibetan man yesterday morning of the mother holding the child, right? The child needs to be held. So these parts of self that have been abandoned and neglected and attacked and so on, it's like when, when there's a loving environment, the, the spacious, loving nature of the heart, these parts will, will come toward and the heart will embrace. And in that embracing, there's just a natural integrative process that happens. And it's very different than trying to change something. It's, it's, a willi- it's about being intimate with our experience. Being intimate and exploring the very core of what that experience is. You know, if it's a sensation or a feeling, a willing to... This has been so interesting to me. Like one of the questions I work with, with people I invite them into, is like, what is in the very core of this? Whatever the this is. What is in the very core of this? Let's say, not contraction in my solar plexus, in my belly, in my heart. Right? Just as an open inquiry. And I won't tell you what happens, right? But check it out. It's really interesting. And if things don't shift just with that question, then ask yourself, is there a belief that goes with this? And see if you can find it, and then ask yourself, what's my deepest knowing about this from the heart? Because what we're doing is we're accessing heart wisdom. So we are, we are aligning with an inner knowing. And this is very helpful in unpacking our conditioning and also revealing what the next obvious step is in our life, and also revealing further, disclosing our true nature. So this is a remarkable, remarkably sensitive and clear, knowing facet of our being, this heart wisdom that we can access um, in very practical ways and in essential ways, too. It's like we, we start coming online with our inner guidance system. This is the inner teacher. This is a very, very important part of the inner teacher. It is the dispeller of darkness. That's a little translation of guru. Is it not? Dispeller of darkness. Guru. Right? The light of awareness shines through the heart, meets the confusion of the conditioned body-mind, saturates that and dispels confusion. I've been trying to boil this down in my work with people for years, and that's about as clear as I can get it. Right? It's a light of awareness, touches this area of confusion, and there's a spontaneous and natural release process that happens with that. I've lost track of time. Okay, we're good. So um, a few brief comments at the end, and then I'd like to do a little experiential inquiry with you, and we can open it up to Q&A. So as this process of the light of awareness infusing the conditioned body-mind, infusing the confusion, a reorientation happens in the body-mind. It begins to orient to our deeper nature, come into greater congruence with that. And our lives begin to change. Our work starts coming into relationship with this. Our relationships start coming more into integrity and congruence with this. Not that it's ever 100% necessarily. We're not looking for perfection. This is a process. The gap is closing between our kind of conditioned, ordinary patterns of living and our deepest knowing and feeling and being. This transforms the way that we act in the world. You know, this is not just an interior 
process. This is an opening up and an outpouring. How then are we going to act in our relationships, in our community, in our nation? Right? We cannot sit back in our caves anymore, you know, or comfort zones. We are called forth. How are each of us going to respond? We listen, right? It could be take very vigorous political action, you know, or not. But the point is to be open to how it wants to move through us, right? And that's a listening. That's a deep listening and honoring and then acting and willing to get out of our comfort zones, willing to tell the difficult truth, have the, the challenging conversations, willing to question authority, particularly when it's poorly aligned with inner integrity. So action is very important. This is a very important part of our, our integrity. If we do not act on our knowing, it subsides. This is a very important principle. Action reinforces this inner alignment. If we don't act on it, we start losing touch. It's very interesting. It's like an inner dialogue. There's not really two of us. You know, it's more like conditioned mind, and we could say conditioned and unconditioned. But we can present it as a kind of increasingly intimate dialogue between our apparent separate self and conditioned mind and our true nature. So we listen, we attune, we let in the revelation, and then we act. And in the acting, we develop a virtuous cycle. And now the difference between inside and outside begins to dissolve. This is the, the great revelation of the heart is our non-separateness our inherent wholeness. We feel it here first, then we feel it everywhere. So it affects our meetings. We feel, you know, we know this as a teaching, but this becomes our experience, we are meeting ourselves in the guise of another. We don't even think about it. This is the felt sense. It's that intimate. Right? I am speaking to myself as you. You are listening to yourself as me. It's that intimate. Lord knows we know that we need that in our lives, in our communities. So I want to invite you in a, into a little um, inquiry. I'm going to ask that you sit comfortably, put your feet on the floor, close your eyes, and take a few deep breaths. And just check with your mind to see if there's any problem that you need to solve right now. It's unlikely there is. So you're giving a message, permission to your problem-solving mind to relax. To realize that there is nothing to achieve or attain. It's enough to be as you are. And to feel the weight of your body held. It's like relax into that, into your chair. Now, if nothing else, let gravity hold your body. But you may also sense that you are held by something much greater. Feel yourself held by that as well. And know that you are also this which is holding all of us. This is another dimension of your being.
And then bring your attention to the heart area and imagine as if you can breathe directly. Inhale and exhale from the heart area. And you may want to put your hand on your heart just as a kind of physical cue. And as you breathe, each breath allows attention to drop more deeply, deeply into the heart. You're in exploration now, very innocent. You're not trying to achieve anything. You're just opening. Beginning to attune. Making yourself available for discovery. And then dropping in the following question. What is the true nature of my heart? What is the true nature of my heart? Don't think about it. Don't go to your mind for an answer. It's not verbal. Or if it is verbal, it's something prior. There may be silence, there may be an image, there may be a felt sense. But whatever comes, open to this, which comes. Receive this gift. Be this, which comes. Give yourself to this. What is the true nature of my heart? Be your true nature. And then a second question, which may be entirely uninteresting and irrelevant, which is, does this need protection? No right answer. Okay, let's take a little while to open your eyes. Mm. 
So we just have a few minutes. If anyone has a question or would like to share, please. Oh, what is the, what is the true nature of your heart? Yeah. By the way, I um, when I, I I've sort of I don't know discovered or developed or refined a process of doing um, dyadic meditative inquiry, where one partner will ask another a question like this um, in a timed way, in a very meditative and slow way, and it's really beautiful. Um, to sit with a partner or a friend with a question, an essential question, like what is the true nature of your heart or who are you, really? And then just let the questions go. Don't go to your mind and just open to what comes. It's quite remarkable. And it's to have someone else pose the question that you don't need to remember what it is, <laughs> which is kind of a relief. Then you can be completely with the response, Right? And then it's beautiful to share with your partner because you're, you're sharing your own unfolding understanding and you um, help induce that as well. So it's a beautiful practice, actually. Back, I'm sorry, over back here? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So for those, a lot of uh, tough situation, you need to make a decision. We are often said, uh, follow your heart instead of this uh, intellectual uh, yeah. uh, analysis. Can yeah. you elaborate? I think it's related to your topic, maybe. With tough decisions, rather than going to the mind, what is, it, what is the experience or meaning of following one's heart? Right. How, you, how do you tell it's following your heart or follow your intellectual ah, okay, <laughs> analysis? Good. Yes. Uh, that's an excellent question, really an important one. Uh, because very often, you can tell by the uh, degree of fear or desire, grasping or clinging comes. So the heart wisdom um, is like, if you imagine a noisy banquet, you know, they're like the guest that's quiet, <laughs> who whispers, right? So you kind of have to learn. It's not going to be, it's not that voice. It's not the noisy, assertive, judgmental voice. It doesn't use the word should. Okay? So those are some hints, you know. I mean, you know, it's described biblically as a still small voice or a small still voice within. It has that quality. Uh, it neither asserts nor des denies. It does not judge. It does not come from fear or desire. So it has often a surprising quality, although sometimes we knew it kind of on a mental level and then it's affirmed inwardly. Uh, it's generally not long range. It's, it's generally about the next obvious step. And in fact, that's all we need to know is the next obvious step. It may, be, it may come as just a subtle somatic inclination. We may just kind of find ourselves inwardly leaning in a particular direction, All right? So it's been, for me, I mean, a lifetime of continual listening and re-listening uh, and following. And uh, the more I followed, the stronger the signal got. So that's another important point. It's a process. So try it with something small, right? Like something not too scary. Like, oh, that person over there at the conference, I just feel drawn to come over and say hello. Give it a try. Yeah, see how it turns out. Yeah, Terry. I did some work with uh, Heart Math Institute in the 90s, and they, we would frequently ask our heart for. The, the, there was a particular practice freeze frame where we would ask our heart for perspective on, mm -hmm. on things. And it very often would be that the heart was at ease and calm, whereas the mind would be agitated and, mm -hmm. and reactive. But uh, I was also informed my years with, with my teacher, Adi Da, uh, he has a teaching about the three hearts, the heart on the left being the physical heart, the heart at the center being the subtle heart, the Anahata chakra, and the heart on the right being Pridayam, the seat of consciousness right. itself. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the Sufis take that central heart and they distinguish between the lower and the higher heart. Mm -hmm. The higher heart being the source of intuitive no knowing and the lower heart being the sentimentalities. More emotional, that's And right. emotional, mm -hmm. yeah. More psychological. Right. Mm -hmm. And all this dissecting can just make things too complicated. In a way, the simplicity of just going to the heart region is, is usually what I find myself directing people to. And I see that you're doing that as well. Mm -hmm. But I find myself intrigued that you did point to the back of the heart. Yes. And uh, that, that resting back into the heart's knowing, it still seems useful, even though with all this sophistication, we could talk about the four hearts like the Sufis do, you know, all kinds of right. nuance. And, and yet that stands out as really, really significant. Yeah. So I wanted to invite you to elaborate on that. Yeah. Well, and you're feeling it a bit now, aren't you? As you just talk about the falling back. In the heart area. So this is what I, um, and by the way, there are those, all those, well, I don't know about the Sufi up and down. For me, it's like in and out, right, rather than hierarchical. But the left and the right, absolutely, and the heart on the right, Ramana spoke of, of course, and Hridayam Granti, the heart not. And I went through years, actually, of that opening uh, in my work with Jean Klein. And on the left is this, not just the physical heart, but the, the kind of a human emotional heart. Uh, there's tenderness uh, in my experience, but nonetheless, you know, uh, this subtle architecture aside, it feels like the essential movement, and and this is something I notice working with people, is a falling back. It's, as I described, it's like it has that archaeological kind of time level depth, and I can feel it when I sit with people, and they can feel it too. They feel like I'm deepening. There's a deepening and a falling back. Um, experience and then an opening up and out and uh, the, the sense of profound surrender that that comes with that and and you know of course those essential qualities radi radi radiating out so this is one of the interesting points we have spiritual traditions that cultivate these essential qualities like compassion for instance or generosity these are kind of the main ones that get uh, emphasized and and that can be done to an extent that's that's a valid practice then the other non practice but more i mean the, there is an investigatory process here a sensing into what's deeply true and and opening to that um, but what's interesting is as we open to our true nature these essential qualities just spontaneously radiate out like rays from the sun and that's beautiful i think we are at we're over time, so thank you so much. Okay.